you know, it was a frustrating year for us. I'm representing the players. We had a lot of players that had great individual years. I was very fortunate in 1979 to play on a world championship club, and I know what it takes to win. And if we can, going into next season, get together as a unit, and 25 guys having the best years we're capable of having, hopefully we can bring a World Series to Minnesota. I doubt even Bert Blylevin realized just how prophetic those words would become. In one short season, the Minnesota Twins would turn from baseball also rans to world's champions. An incredible tale that touched the hearts, minds, and imagination of millions all across the country. It's the story of an underdog that beat the odds to win it all. We're gonna win, Twins. We're gonna score. We're gonna win, Twins. What's that baseball score? The story of the 1987 world champion, Minnesota Twins. Cheer for the Minnesota Twins today. The Twins convened for a press conference introducing key additions to their front office staff. Executive Vice President Andy McPhail. Director of Major League Personnel, Bob Gebhardt. Vice President of Baseball, Ralph Hawk, and at a later press conference would name President Jerry Bell, all designed to give the Twins a new look, both in terms of wardrobe and on the field leadership, as Tom Kelly was named manager. I'm very fortunate right now to get an opportunity to run a major league ball club. It's a dream come true for me. I'm looking forward to it with enthusiasm to get with the, the rest of the team here and sit down and get myself going and get my coaching staff going so I can get to the job of, of getting the spring training and getting the ball players prepared for a championship season. Along with spring training began the task of overcoming the specter of a dismal sixth place finish the year before. But when the exhibition results were accounted for, Minnesota finished at the top. A winning spring training record of 14 and 10 was a resounding indication that the Twins were indeed ready for that championship season. But Tom Kelly's troops were also up to some tomfoolery. <laughs> With past disappointments all but forgotten, new shenanigans were underfoot. <laughs> and Kirby Puckett's booming bat led to a run-in with the law. Puck was taking some extra BP, hit a few bombs out of here and just cr crushed the windshield of the car. All of a sudden, the next thing you see are four motorcycles with cops on them coming after them. In the process, I keep hitting, and the police officer hollers to uh, Andy McPhill or some guy. He said, that guy in the cage swings at another ball. I'm going to throw him in jail. So I got out of there. He stopped batting practice and everything. I got out of there, and I had to stay out of jail somehow. <laughs> the police, however, were on a recruiting drive. Kirby was our kind of guy. We need him for our OPD softball team. So we sent our own Sergeant Newsom out to talk to him, see if he wanted to join up. Uh, I don't think he wanted to take us seriously, though. Uh, he was knocking some, some pretty good balls over the fence there, over the left field fence, and a couple of them hit some vehicles. We got in the middle, but we got it all squared away when Andy McPhail came out on the field. But the man who truly arrested the team's imagination was reliever Jeff Reardon, an acquisition who put the Twins' potential into clear perspective. So with all the missing pieces present, the Twins' remaining task was to put the puzzle together. I think it's just a matter of 24 guys uniting together. We had a lot of guys last year that had great individual years, but we didn't gel together as a ball club. And this year in 87, if we can gel together as a ball club, if guys can pick up each other and uh, just everybody have the best year we're capable of having, I don't see any reason why we can't win our division. With Burt's crystal ball working just right, Minnesota's positive viewpoint crystallized during the first two weeks of the season, and the youthful twins showed off a new maturity. 
On opening day, a crowd of 43,000 was on hand to see whether Burt Blylevin and the Twins could live up to their striking preseason predictions. Steve Lombardozzi erupted in the bottom of the third with a double that put the Oakland A's in deep trouble. Then as manager Tom Kelly looked on, Kirby Puckett connected on the very next pitch. Swung on a long drive to left, way back, a home run. Home run for Kirby Puckett, the Twins lead two to one. With a score tied in the tenth, Puckett picked one. Back goes Puckett at the fence, and he leaps, he got it! Oh, what a catch! I thought that we had uh, everything we needed and more. I thought that this team was really going to be something when the year started. Another opening day hero, Kent Herbeck, delivered in the 10th. Into the head of Tonseco, a single for Herbeck, scoring Lombardozzi, and the Twins pull it out to win it 5-4. to four. After a three-game sweep of Oakland, it was on to Seattle, where the Twins took two out of three. Steve Lombardozzi helped break the ice. That's a base hit. Lombardozzi scores Smalley. And Randy Bush helped ice the win with his first home run of the season. Yeah, that's big trouble. Oh, out of here. Touch them all, Randy Bush. I think the biggest factor was that we were learning to win. And I think early in the season, it helped us as the season progressed. Their winning ways progressed in Oakland as the Twins took two of three from yet another Western Division foe. Line to left center, way back, and pass Murphy and to the wall. Two runs are going to score. The route is on as the Twins have up the lead on a Herbeck double to left center. The outlook was especially bright when catcher Tom Nieto contributed with four RBIs in two days. Twins lead five to one on a two-run single to right center by Tommy Nieto. I never thought about the odds. I was just uh, telling friends and, and relatives to go out and place a bet on us if you wanted to get a good chance to win some money. The Twins were odds-on favorite in Anaheim when slugger Gary Guidi made book on a long shot. Oh, boy, that smoked. Way back. Hey, touch them all, Gary Guidi. Three-run blast. Holy cow, right over the center field fence. The Twins shook Western Division rivals some more. They greeted Seattle with a Roy Smalley smash. Smalley hits a high drive to right. There it goes, way back. Upstairs, a home run. After two more victories against Seattle, Minnesota had blasted off to their second best start ever, 10 and four. The first place Twins had established a winning attitude. Kind of set the tone for the rest of the year where we'd win the big games when we had to. The Twins' hot start must also be attributed to the new man behind Minnesota's managerial door, Tom Kelly. It was Kelly who authored the winning game plan. I uh, had to instill a good attitude in the ball club. Attitude's a big part of the game, and all the coaches that I've spoken with, uh, hockey, football, basketball, they all say the same thing. The players have to have a good attitude and enjoy what they're doing, or you're not going to get anything out of them. Wait, 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 wait. And Kelly's approach resulted in a unique relationship with his players. He never asked for, for more than you can give. All he did was ask you to just come to the park, prepare yourself to play, and give him 100%. That's all he asked. I mean, TK's always had good numbers. He's won just about every place he's been. And, uh, and this year was no exception. Just so he's, he seems like one of the guys. I mean, he hasn't sit on a pedestal and say, hey, I'm the manager, and you guys listen to what I do. I do what is right for the Minnesota Twins, which I feel is right for the Minnesota Twins. And, and uh, Mr. McPhail hired me to do what's right, in my opinion. So uh, that's the way I, I go about things, and I, you know, I don't back off from anybody else. Kelly's leadership kept the Twins on an even keel, and they prospered greatly from his day-to-day -day approach. We don't try to get too high and uppity, and we don't try to get too down when things don't go so well. We try to stay in the middle, and we try to have fun with it uh, to a point where we're not way up on a high plateau, you know. If we stay in the middle and we'll have our fun, the guys try. They're trying very hard for themselves, for the organization, and for everybody that supported us. Uh, uh, win, lose, or draw, they're giving it their best shot. Tom Kelly's approach led the Twins to the stairway of success. And it was never more evident than in June, when Kelly's regular group of heroes was joined by a platoon of other champions. The twins were heavily armed with soldiers who waged winning warfare. 
And while the Big Four contributed in a big way all season, it was the contributions from other sources that helped the Twins emerge victorious. When it was time to leave for battle, everybody contributed. Steve Lombardozzi on the offensive. Line drive, too tall for Scott Fletcher. Odovi charges, they're gonna send him. Game is over. From high impact conflict to the Butero bombing. Swing and a long drive in the left field, down in the left field corner, and that ball is off the wall. A faces clearing double for Sal Butero. And how about Bush Commander Randy? Bush swings and lines it down the right field line. Fair ball. Here comes Al Newman to score. Randy Bush to second base with a stand-up double. Twins lead five to four. Baptism under fire. Rookie Gene Larkin mobilizes foot soldier Greg Gagne. Could be the ball game. Jackson unleashes the throw. It's on the money, but he's safe at home, and the Twins win. And long ball lieutenant Tim Lodner. Hi, way back. Boston will have a play at the track. No, it's gone. For a moment, it looked like he had it. And the troops even tried hand-to-hand -hand combat in Milwaukee. By June's end, Minnesota had fought hold of a two-game lead in the West Division thanks to a potent attack. And a pitching staff that was moving on target course. As July started, Burke Blyleven was six and six. By season's end, the curveball artist hurled 15 victories. He surpassed Jim Perry on Minnesota's all-time win list and proved to pitch his best when the going got toughest. The same could be said for starter Frank Viola. Similarly, Viola was 6-6 six and six at the end of June, but finished with a flourish to win 17, his confidence shining through despite an abysmal start. I was two and five, but I had the confidence going, and I knew good things were going to happen. You know, there was a course there where I lost the game, 3-2, one nothing. You know, you know those games are going to turn around, especially with the offense we have. But when it was all said and done, Frank Viola would have the type of season which dreams are made of. Both Viola and Blylevin earned the hands-down respect of both manager and teammate. When we needed a game out of Frankie, a big game, he just, he always rose to the occasion. And uh, the same thing with Bert. You know, when we needed a big game, those two guys uh, pitched their hearts out. As did Les Straker, the 28-year-old rookie who only accumulated eight wins, but who pitched valiantly in key games. Les was even more important when the Twins lost starter Mike Smithson. The front office filled the gap when the six foot eight inch pitcher was cut down by an injury. The Twins felt an urgency to fill the void with some experienced veterans, namely knuckleballer Joe Necro. And future Hall of Famer Steve Carlton. But when push came to shove, the call went to the Bullpen Express. And there to answer, Keith Atherton, the six foot four reliever, delivering seven wins for the Twins. Yet another rush hour specialist, the ever popular Juan Berenguer. Magic Juan gathered in eight wins and at times made batters look like matadors, waving at his bull-like fastball. But the main bullpen man was relief specialist Jeff Reardon, who collected 31 saves in some pressure-packed situations. Of course, there's a lot of pressure. You know, you're going to be the one that's remembered uh, probably the most because you either get the last out or you're going to lose the game. So. That's probably the toughest part of the job is mentally it's harder on you than it is physically. Much of Minnesota's success from June till October stemmed directly from the pitching prowess of Jeff Reardon. But despite the positive aspects of Minnesota's pitching core, the Twins ran into a real dry spell in June. Four consecutive losses to the Texas Rangers helped the Twins drop their four-game lead in the Western Division standings. And as the pennant race tightened, a familiar nemesis stalked in the wings. After a four-game set with the Twins, the Kansas City Royals were ticketed to take a share of first place. Oh, uh, double play. Oh, that ball's hit well. Gladden can't get it. And it's a three-run homer for George Brett. Even a former twin cost the win, Jim Eisenreich. Eisenreich mashes it. Kirby Puckett. Can't get it. Bianca Lana is coming around third. And this game's over. Former twin Jim Eisenreich gets the game-winning RBI.
and the final score, four to three. And the Royals would take three of four from the slumping twins who had lost seven of eight. A look at the standings clearly showed that it was time for Minnesota to take a deep breath. On July 4th, the Twins were a percentage point behind the Royals. And although July ushered in a rough schedule filled with tough Eastern Division clubs, the Minnesota fans were hoping that the Twins were ready to accept the challenge. Over the 4th of July weekend, the Twins flagged down the explosive Baltimore Orioles with an exciting 11th inning win. Base hit! Twins will win! Steve Lamberdozzi lines a single to center. Two days later, Kent Herbeck completed a three-game sweep of the Orioles with one swing. Herbeck swings a drive at the deep right, deep, and it's a home run over the canvas in right field. A game-winning homer for Kent Herbeck. Minnesota recaptured first place the next day as Frank Viola hurled a complete game masterpiece in New York to complete a four-game win streak, and the Twins were back on track. The Twins would grasp onto first for the rest of July as Burt Blylevin surpassed Ferguson Jenkins on the all-time strikeout list in a game against New York. And against powerful Toronto, the Twins harness lightning by breaking a 10-game dry spell against the Blue Jays. He hits it hard. Left field, and that thing is gone. Gary Gaetti. All in all, the Twins more than held their own against the Eastern Division, but it was more than their usual display of timely hits that kept the club in first through most of July. It was also a display of airless baseball, including a stretch of 10 consecutive airless games, the type of consistent glove work that the Twins showcased all season long. July ended with a defensive sparkle. August came in on a rather odd note. Defenders of Truth and Justice filed an unusual complaint against knuckleballer Joe Negro. Then they start drilling Joe, and Joe looked like a little kid out there in the mound. He didn't know what to say, what to do. It was really quite funny to me. I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry when I saw that sandpaper and uh, and file come out of his pocket. They're checking him all over. I've never seen him. Do a search like this, oh, quite Negro. like this before. <laughs> Apparently, Joe keeps a file in his pocket to, to file his fingernails. He threw that out and landed right next to my foot. To watch the expression of, of one of the umpires uh, following this, the sandpaper from his pocket to the ground and watching one of the players try and cover it up with his foot, <laughs> to me, was uh, quite funny. Now, poor old Joe bagged the suspension despite his claims of innocence. As a result, Negro picked up a lot of support. Rock star Huey Lewis 
even got in on the act, and Joe Negro fans decided to start a defense fund to protect their fallen hero. Uh, Joe Negro Defense Fund, and the proceeds are going towards uh, Joe Negro's defense to prevent any suspension and to prove that everybody carries a uh, Emory board. Despite claims of innocence, Joe would have to face a suspension. But Necro would be back to pitch in one of the most key series of the entire season, a four-game set against Oakland. Tony La Russa's club came into town in a virtual tie with the Twins for first place. And when they left, Mark McGuire and his teammates were dumbfounded. Oakland's Dave Stewart was in the midst of a personal seven-game win streak when Kent Herbeck clocked his 25th home run of the season. The deep left center field, way back, and gone. La Russa and 40,000 others on hand observed as Stewart allowed five earned runs, and Kirby Puckett was also partly responsible. On the left side, through! That's for one run will score. All the way to the wall. Bush will come around, three runs score, and Puckett holds up at second. And the Twins completed a 9-4 route in the opener. Back on hand to pitch after appealing his suspension was Joe Necro. And once again, Minnesota shined when it counted most. Very, very important games. And I think at that particular time was when we played the best baseball throughout the whole season. 0-2 pitch, hit in the air to right field. Davis goes back. It's off the wall. Gaetti will score, and Bernanski goes into second base. 2-2 pitch. Hit up the middle. Polonia will charge, but it's in front of him for a base hit. Bernanski comes around, and he'll score the second. Really using him to his best. Butera lines a base hit into left field. Lombardozzi will come around and score the third Twins run. Tony La Russa's pitching surrendered 34 runs in four days as the Twins rolled up some awesome offensive numbers at the Metrodome. Ken Herbeck contributed with three home runs during the series. Well, that ball may not come back. Got. And Minnesota completed an important four-game sweep as Tony La Russa's troops were temporarily dismissed from the race. With a three-and-a-half game lead on August 10th, the Twins sensed that they were on the verge of a special season. Just how special was yet to be revealed. But the glimpse of enthusiasm that winning brought was a joy for every fan to behold. Looking in your eyes, I see a paradise. This world that I found is too good to be true. Standing here beside you, want so much to give you this love in my heart that I'm feeling for you. Let him see what I don't care about that Put your hand in my hand, baby Don't ever look back Let the world around us Just fall apart Baby, we can make it If we're heart to heart And we can build this dream together Standing strong forever Nothing's gonna stop us now And if this Twins fans and the Minnesota Twins have always held a special relationship. But it was beginning to exhibit itself more clearly than ever whenever the Twins played at the Dome. Opponents were running into a mess of trouble. In mid-August, the Dome field advantage was more apparent than ever when the Seattle Mariners came for a visit. They're, they're so hot here that it's unbelievable. I can't believe the difference between the team that we played in Seattle and the team that we're playing here. I mean, last night in the first inning, uh, they looked like sharks. They really did in, in, uh, in a pool of blood. And that ball is hit deep to right field. Kingery going back to the track to the wall. Fly away. They're like sharks in a feeding frenzy. We like playing there. Just home sweet dome. 
home sweet dome indeed. Twins fans were becoming rampant. 52 tickets. Can I get 52 or brand 52 tickets for you? Pennant fever was in the air. The thrill of victory was everywhere. And of course, the Seattle Mariners paid the price. Brunanski belts the ball deep to left field. Bill Bradley goes to the wall, high away. Twins are incredible here in Minneapolis. The fever was catching on all over the Twin Cities with no exception and with clear reception. Oh, and it would go Twins, go. Go Twins, go. Go Twins, go. Twins, go! Go, Twins! And the Twins responded to the support with the results that reflected an undying appreciation from the players themselves. That was one of the biggest reasons we're, we're so good at home is the fans really come out to the ballpark. They really support the team, and, you know, the guys want to go out there and play for the fans as much as they do for themselves. Fastball popped up. This should do it. Newman, the shortstop, calling. Makes a short two-handed catch, and the Mariners are swept in this four-game series in Minnesota. The Twins were becoming unbeatable at home, and the rest of the league knew it. But what was Minnesota's secret dome field advantage, and who or what mysterious force was responsible for the Twins' dizzying success there? I think the reason that we play so well at home is uh, before every big game, upon entering the stadium, our fans are given instructions to... Uh, take a deep breath while we're hitting and hold it. Uh, therefore, it uh, makes the air less dense and the ball travels a lot better. The reason why we play so well in the dome is because we turn the fans on when we hit for home runs and blow them in when the other team's hitting. <laughs> the reason why the Minnesota Twins win so much at home is because, like Dorothy said from Wizard of Oz, there's no place like dome. There's no place like dome. Or maybe the dome dwarf himself has something to do with it. Legend has it that the dwarf mystically redirects fly balls from opponents' myths. Well, losing clubs always seem to concoct painful excuses for their own misfortunes. But one logical reason for Minnesota's magical record at the Dome might stem from the ear-splitting noise that the fans create, equivalent to that of a jetliner. Prompting some less than casual observers to rename the Metrodome entirely. Thunderdome. Kirby Puckett should know he caused much of the Dome's thunder with his booming bat. And on August 29th, Kirby took his thundering bat to Milwaukee, where he put together one of the most remarkable two-day stretches in baseball history, tying an American League record with 10 hits in 11 at-bats. Way back! Touch them all, Kirby Three to nothing, Twins lead. How oh, did he smoke that one? Tom Treblehorn saw Kirby collect four hits and five at-bats. Hey, Kirby's got another one! Way back! Touch them all, Kirby Puckett! Next day, I come back to Sunday, and I feel great. I remember telling the guys, I feel great today again, guys. Something's going to happen. In the first, Kirby single. In the third, he hit a home run, two for two. In the fifth, he singled again, three hits. In the sixth, Kirby doubled, four for four. Then he even saved a grand slam with a defensive gem. Oh, boy. Caught by Kirby. What a grab. In the eighth, he collected his fifth hit, five for five. Good enough for mere mortals, but not Kirby. In the ninth. Way back. Oh, touch them all, Kirby Puckett. What a game. Six for six. It's a day that I'll never forget. I mean, I was... Everything I hit just seemed to fall in. Didn't matter where I hit it, it just seemed to fall in. And we won, so that was important too. That was the most important thing. Kirby Puckett's performance put the Twins back in first place. And this time, they were determined to stay there for good. The high-flying Twins were believing that the force was with them, the force of fan support. And against Cleveland, the force of their bats. There she goes. Back, back. And touch them all, Tom Brunetsky. 
Gagne swings, face hit to left. Here's Gladden, green lighted. He'll try to score, there'll be a play. He's safe at home. Bush swings and lines one to deep right. Way back, touch them all, Randy Bush. After a three-game sweep of Cleveland, the magic number had been reduced to 10 as Minnesota played host to the Rangers. A combination of Oakland losses and Twins wins caused the magic number countdown to continue. In the center field, Brower coming on, he gets by him, and he should go all the way around. And inside the park home run for Greg Hagney, and the Twins win 4 0. Fletcher is down, that's 10 for Viola, and the Metrodome is rocking. The magic number is six. It looks to be going down some more tonight. The magic number is five. The countdown still continued. And as they faced Kansas City, the Twins had the opportunity to clinch a tie. The fans were cheering and, and applauding and everything before the game even started. And I know the guys' hearts were beating fast. And Gary Gaetti said, let's go, guys. Come on, let's do it. We're going to do it today. Bucket drives it to center. Wilson going back. It's deep. It's deep. It's gone. It Gaetti tries one to deep center. Wilson going back. And this one is gone. Very similar to Puckett's. Way back. And gone. Football press box. Three first inning home runs. And Burt Blylevin's masterful pitching reduced the magic number to one. Saying thanks just isn't enough. We're going to bring the flag home with us. Thank you. Only one thing remained between the Twins and the Western Division title, the Texas Rangers. At Arlington Stadium, the air was thick with anticipation. Kelly's heroes were gunning for the clinch, and the man called on to pitch in the pinch, Joe Necro. Smash, double play, just like that. Amadosi. Let's get big lead at first. And a drive, hit into deep left field. Way back, and it is gone, a home run! Steve Lombardozzi has just tied the game for the Twins with a three-run blast here in the fourth inning. Jeff Russell to Steve Lombardozzi in a 1-1 delivery. Twins lead, four to three. Lombardozzi delivers with a clutch base hit to right. Oh, my, what a night. And the Twins were finally on the very verge of clinching the pennant. With the clinch, a cinch. Team owner Carl Polad watched at home. The air was still thick with tension and anticipation when Jeff Reardon was called on to terminate the situation. Dow with his lead, Herbeck plays behind him, and a little fly ball to the second baseman, Lava Rosie, the throw to first, they got it! The Twins win the championship! <laughs> a happy and victorious moment for Mr. and Mrs. Polan. Come on, Daddy! And for the players, a jubilant victory celebration that will never be forgotten. Yeah, we had all kinds of stars in the game, but we had some fun. We had some fun out there, and it was great that we could end it this way. We wanted to do it so we could trash their field. <laughs> but it wasn't, wasn't one man carrying the whole load. Everybody did their share, and it was everybody contributing either the day or the day after. And it wasn't, it wasn't the same players. And we're, we're a team. We're playing as a team, and that's the way to win. All we can do is now uh, just win the league championship series and go to the World Series and win, and, and then uh, my lifelong dream will be fulfilled. That World Series dream would be just around the corner. But the Twins were taking things one day at a time, and after returning from this final road trip, there was some time to enjoy their Western Division victory. The Twins returned home to a triumphant celebration at the airport. But there was still an important task at hand. You see, Carl Polat had agreed to shine Joe Necro's shoes if the knuckleballer managed to help clinch the Western Division title. Emery Joe made good on his end of the bargain. Now it was Mr. Polad's turn. Hey, it's not every day of the week a fella gets his boss to shine his shoes, but as long as the boss didn't mind, Joe was willing to enjoy it.
Oh, well, the good-natured fun ended with a hearty handshake. The Twins fans were anxiously awaiting the main event with hope that the Twins could indeed polish off the American League Eastern Division winning Tigers. With the task of winning the American League pennant at hand, the Twins greeted the Eastern Division champion Detroit Tigers and manager Sparky Anderson with confidence. This is where we want it to be, and that's all you need to know. Indeed, the Twins were where they wanted to be, and despite being heavy underdogs, Tom Kelly's team was doggedly determined. And with yet a new ally at hand, the Homer Hankey. Detroit's September hero, Doyle Alexander, is on the mound, but this was October, and Gary Gaiety was batting. Swing a high fly ball up the deep right center field. Way back, way back it is. A home run, but the nothing twin. It's a pitch by Alexander, a swing and a fly ball hit off the deep right center field. Way back, way back, and it's a home run. Gary Gaiety. You never know what's going to happen in those situations. I'd never been in the playoffs before, and I was just trying to relax. It's nice to know that the game doesn't change a whole lot. It's just everything else surrounding the game. And you got a lot of people in the stands. I probably had more fun in those playoff games um, than any other time during the season. It was really enjoyable to play baseball especially with the Minnesota offense crushing the ball. Swings it. It's a line drive down the right field line. It's a fair ball bouncing off the campus. Larry Herndon playing the carry. Push around second. He's going to go for three. And he slides in with a triple. Stansky swings. Ground ball. Base hit on the third base. Down the left field line. Bush has scored. Bernanski on his way to second. Swing. Line drive. Right field. Base hit. Bernanski scores. And it's four to one twin. The Twins led after five, but Sparky Anderson's Tigers began to claw their way back. And here's a long blast. Brunanski back. He's a spectator. And you can see it's the first signs of uneasiness that Tom Kelly has shown. After falling behind, Minnesota tied it on Kirby Puckett's double. Then veteran Don Baylor batted. He said, in comes the pitch. Swing and a line drive, base hit, left field. Kirby Puckett scores. The Twins lead six to five. Minnesota would score four in the eighth to dump Detroit in the opener, eight to five. With one victory under their belts, Minnesota starter Burt Blylevin faced the Tigers, the team with the Major League's best record during the regular season. And with the Homer Hankies out again. Outfielder Chet Lemon was determined to stop them from waving in the second inning. And Lemon oh. drives one to deep left. Gladden turns and watches it leave. Chet Lemon's 420-foot home run gave the Tigers an early lead off the home run plagued by Lemon. Then with a 2-0 advantage, native Minnesotan Jack Morris took his perfect 8-0 Metrodome record to the mound. And with runners on first and second, he faced Tim Laudner. Swing, line drive in the left field. That's going down into the corner. Bernanski will score. Here's Gagne at third base. He's going to try to score the throw to the plate. He scores, and the Twins lead three to two on a double by Laudner. In the fourth inning, Dan Gladden batted with the bases loaded in one out. After fouling off two, two ball and two strike pitches, Jack Morris delivered, and so did Dan Glenn. Line drive, base hit, left field. One run is in. Here comes Bernanski. He's going to score the Twins lead. Five to two. And in the fifth inning, Minnesota's lead was extended some more by Ken Herbeck. Swing and a drive hit out to deep left field. Way back. Going, going. And it is a home run for Herbeck into the left center field seats, and the Twins lead it six to two. But Ken Herbeck and the Twins not only excelled at the plate, but helped protect Burt Wylevin's lead with some defensive razzle-dazzle in the eighth inning. Swings up the ground ball behind third base, backhanded by Gatti. Long throw to first base, and Herbeck reaches out, lying down, and catches the ball. I've called it the couch potato play, as everybody's known. Uh, I really did not actually stretch for the ball with my legs. I just kind of laid down and uh, reached out, and the ball found my glove. I mean, it was one of those things. 
And Sparky Anderson was staring a two-game deficit in the eye when Juan Berenguer blew the Tigers back to Detroit. There's the windup, the 2-2 pitch. Swing and a miss, he struck him out. Berenguer striking out four of the five men he faced. The final score, the twin six, the Tigers three. The dome field advantage was at work again, but now the Twins would have to win on the road. Walt Terrell was Detroit's starter for game three, held the Twins scoreless through three innings. But the Tigers failed to protect a 5-0 lead as the Twins fought their way back. There's a high drive, deep left center field, way back out there, and that ball is in the lower deck. A home run for Tom Bernanski. Letting the Tiger lead to five to four here in the sixth. Base hit right field. Platten scores. Gagne comes in to score. Twins leading the game as Herbeck gains third base. It's now six to five. Minnesota leading. With one of the biggest comebacks in playoff history in the making, the Twins turned things over to Jeff Reardon in the bottom of the eighth. With pinch runner Jack Morris taking his lead off first, Reardon delivered to Pat Sheridan. Drives one to deep right, way back, it's on its way, and the Tigers have the lead. As disappointing as it was to the Twins, Sheridan's home run was emotionally uplifting for the Tigers as the momentum was in danger of shifting. But would it carry over to game four as Frank Tanana faced the Twins club in quest of only its 30th road win of the season? But once again, the underdogs perform like champions, Kirby Puckett. Here's a curve to Kirby and a long belt, deep to left, way back into the seats. Touch them all, Kirby Puckett. The Twins have tied the game. The 1-1 one -one delivery, it's a changeup, and it's hit high, and it's hit deep to left. It's back, it's back, it's gone. Touch them all, Greg Gagne. The Twins have the lead at 2-1. One. one out and pitch it to Gene Larkin, up for nine. Swung on a ground ball over third, down the left field line. Here comes Gagne home as the Twins lead four to two. Then the key defensive play of the game in the sixth inning. The set of circumstances that set that up worked perfectly. The ball was low. Laudner handled it perfect and came up and threw a good, you know, made a good throw to third. A lot of people talk about that as being a turning point in that, in that game, which it was, and uh, maybe even in the series. As Reardon leans in to take the sign, here's the set and the pitch. Curve strike three, call the breaking ball, and got him looking. Reardon had redeemed himself by preserving a 5-3 win as the Twins jumped ahead in the series three games to one. As game five was about to begin, the Twins were feeling confident of their chances to wrap the series up with a road win. It was good. That's it. And as Twins fans gathered to watch their heroes, they shared the same certainty. The boss let me off early. I was down here we won the Western Division Championship, and I wanted to come down for this because I think we're going to do it right now this afternoon. We're off today, of course. We're not working, but uh, Detroit Tigers! As Twins fans looked on, starter Burt Blylevin pitched shutout ball for the first three innings, and he received some dazzling defensive support from shortstop Greg Gagne. But Minnesota's game plan also included a four-run second-inning outburst. Bernanski, a line drive into right field. It's a fair ball just inside the line. Gaetti will score. Bush is rounding third base. They're waving him in. Lombardozzi getting his lead at second base. And the pitch. Sinker swung on. Line drive. Base hit left center field. That'll score Lombardozzi with a third run of the inning. And the Twins lead at 3-0. Of course, back in Minnesota, Twins fans were celebrating early and with good reason. The man who had posted a perfect 9-0 record for Detroit during the regular season, Doyle Alexander, was being pummeled in the playoffs. Now the pitch on the way. Swung on, lined hard in the left field for a solid base hit. They're going to send Gladden in as Gibson nonchalantly throws the ball into third base. Gibson just sort of gave up on any attempt to try to get Gladden at the plate. That's a little surprising. He had nothing to lose by making an effort. Well, maybe the Tigers sense that the American League pennant was finally in the cards for Minnesota.
As Burnett gets a high fly ball to deep left field. Boy, this is really tagged. And back goes Gibson all the way, tries to reach over the railing, and he can't get it. It's a home run for Tom Bernanski, and the Twins now lead it 7-4. to four. As the high fives rage from Detroit to the Twin Cities, all that remained now was for the Twins to seize that final out. Braden Lopez the sign from Lodner as Whitaker leads at second, Gibson from first, and the pitch. Fastball swung on a ground ball to rear, and he's got it. Throws it to Herbeck, and the Minnesota Twins are the American League champions. And how does that sound? The Minnesota Twins, American League champions, for the first time since 1965. The American League pennant belongs to the Minnesota Twins. A moment in the sun to savor for eternity and a time that will one day live as an exclamation point in Minnesota folklore. But the overflow of emotions was just an inkling of the outcry that was yet to come. That same night at the Metrodome, twin spans patiently waited for the triumphant return of their heroes. And when they appeared, the love and admiration streamed forth in a heartfelt scene that will be talked about forever. Championship Series MVP Gary Guidi was overcome by the moment. And I just, I couldn't control it. You know, I just had to cry. And then I just couldn't help it. It's just, it was that sentimental for me and that special. That, uh, you know, I didn't really care what anybody thought, you know. It just, it touched me, touched my heart, and I just, you know, I broke down. Tears of joy glistened in many eyes that night. And the anticipation of the thrills that still lay ahead was the Twins' only remaining goal. Baseball's World Championship. The fanfare for the 1987 World Series had begun. The bustle around town was heightened to new proportions as all were eager to open baseball's 84th World Series. The starter for Minnesota's opponents, the St. Louis Cardinals, Joe McGrain. For the Twins, it was Frank Viola. And the Twins' favorite lucky charm was out in full force. After the Cardinals jumped ahead 1-0, Ken Herbeck and the Twins drew blood in the fourth. Fans really jumped for joy when left fielder Dan Gladden cleared the bases. High ball, left field, it's deep, it's back, it's way back, it's gone! Touch them all, Dan Gladden, on a grand slam home run, and the Twins lead 7-1. to one. Sweet music to Frank Viola's ears as the left-hander allowed only one run through eight innings en route to a 10-to-1 cakewalk. The only line of business that remained was a salutation to his newlywed brother. And Keith Atherton went about the business of recording the game's final out. For Minnesota, a mighty World Series debut. And as the fans turned out for game two, anticipating more of the same, the Twins' ticket to success was still deeply ingrained in Tom Kelly's day-to-day -day approach. His philosophy about staying on an even keel and taking uh, one day at a time 
not getting too high, not getting too low, uh, became ingrained in us. People commented on the way we played, the way we played with such maturity. And, uh, and again, I don't know if the players really realized what had transpired. I think Tom's philosophy had carried over into the postseason, and that uh, was the main reason why we played with such maturity. The man the Twins looked up to in game two of the series was Burt Flyleven. For St. Louis, Danny Cox was called upon to pitch, but the Twins reached him early. Breaking ball swung on a fly ball into deep left field. Way back, it is a home run for Gary Gatti. The Twins lead one to nothing. Twins batting in the bottom half of the fourth inning. Last night, they scored seven runs in the fourth. Here's the pitch. Line drive, base hit, right field. Kirby Puckett will score. Ken Herbeck will score. Gaetti on his way to third. It's a double for Randy Bush. And the Twins lead three to nothing. Tom Kelly's next hero was Tim Laudner, chairman of the Buck 98 fan club. Here's a bound ball, base hit, left field. One run scores. Here's Randy Bush trying to score. Coleman throw to the plate. It is not in time. Randy Bush is in with a fifth run for the Twins. Two run single by Laudner, and the Twins lead five to nothing. Laudner would go two for three with three RBIs and a home run as the Twins scored eight runs on ten base hits. And as Jeff Reardon closed out an 8-4 victory, the Twins found themselves running away with the first two games of the series. An unexpected but enviable position for underdogs to be in. Then it was time to pack the gear and head to St. Louis and Bush Stadium. The starter in Game 3 was Les Stryker, who pitched valiantly through six innings, striking out four, allowing no runs. But Juan Berenguer allowed three runs in relief, and the Cardinals were off the deck. A three-to-one win that uplifted St. Louis spirits. In game four, Minnesota jumped on top early when Greg Gagne connected in the third inning. Here's the 2-0 delivery, high drive, deep left field, way back, way back, touch them all, Greg Gagne and the Twins lead one to nothing. Oh, a blast to the low Jerry in left field. What a clout by Gagne and the Twins have a one to nothing lead. But Frank Viola was roughed up badly in the almighty fourth when Tom Lawless broke a 1-1 deadlock with a home run. An unexpected blow from a most unlikely source, a man who had only collected two hits during the regular season. With a series deadlock to two games apiece, the Cardinals capped off game five with a two RBI performance by Kurt Ford. All total, the Cardinals scored four runs on 10 base hits and a series record tying five stolen bases in their Bush Stadium finale. with the so-called Twinkies facing elimination as a result of a St. Louis sweep. The Twins had to win two with their backs against the wall, but they had yet to lose with the home run hanky present. My baby does the hanky paint. The Twins took the field for game six. Hoping for all the support they could muster. With Les Straker pitching in the biggest game of his career, second baseman Tommy Herr opened things up with a home run. It was only Herr's third home run all season long, and for St. Louis, it was a one to nothing lead. Minnesota's hitting attack swung into high gear early. 
Kirby Puckett single to left field in the first inning tied the game at one. And with Kirby Puckett leading off of second base, Don Baylor put the Twins ahead by one run with a single to right field scoring Puckett. But St. Louis would claim a 5-2 lead until the fifth. Gary Guidi launched a double that gave Minnesota their third run. Then the heroics were left to the able bat of Don Baylor. High fly ball, deep left, there it goes. A home run for Don Baylor. The game is tied at five. It was Baylor's first home run in well over a month, but it certainly could not have come at a more opportune time. Then with the Twins leading 6-5 to five in the sixth, reliever Ken Daly faced Kent Herbeck. Ball swung a long drive. Center field, way back, way back. It is a grand slam. Herbeck, a grand slam homer over the center field fence. First pitch, 10-5 win. It was the 15th Grand Slam in series history, and the miraculous Minnesota Twins were on the verge of evening the series. Here's the set by Reardon, and the pitch. Swing and a high pop foul behind the plate. Wagner throwing away the mass, may have a play. He does, he has it, and the game is over. A 10-5 win that set the stage for a grand finale, the game in which dreams are either made or broken. Game 7 of the World Series. St. Louis stormed ahead to an early lead, but as usual, the Twins fought their way back. Tim Lobner's single in the second inning resulted in a controversial play at the plate. While Don Baylor was called out, the next batter brought the Twins to within one, Steve Lombardozzi. Swing and a ground ball up the middle, a base hit. Here is Berninski around third base. He will score, throw back to second base, and Lobner dies back. It's now two to one, St. Louis. Lombardozzi singles up the middle. In the Twins' fifth, with Minnesota still trailing by a run, Greg Gagne beat out an infield hit. Another disputed play this time. It resulted in a Minnesota base runner and a departure for Joe McGrain. With McGrain out, the Twins dug in against the arm-weary Danny Cox. Swing, drive hit into right center field. That's going to be in there, and it's going to find the gap all the way to the fence. Greg Gagne around third will score on the double by Puckett. The game is tied at two. The Twins took the lead in the sixth. Swing a ground ball behind third. Great stop by Lawless. The long throw to first base is not in time. Gagne beats it out. Bernanski scores a Twins lead three to two. With Frank Viola on the verge of MVP honors for an outstanding effort, reliever Jeff Reardon was asked to close the show one last time. Here's the pitch. Swing a bouncing ball to God. He has it. Goes to Herbert. And the Twins are baseball's world champion. The world champion, Minnesota Twins. The Twins win it four to two. Let's listen to this crowd. What else? The only thing that remained was the celebration. The impossible dream had become reality. The Minnesota Twins had proven themselves to be the best. And the trophy presentation symbolized how far the Twins had come. They told me a few years ago that they shouldn't have had baseball in Minnesota, and you've made it uh, very real. It's a class organization. It was a great win. Congratulations to you, Carl. Right. That right. thing's pretty heavy. <laughs> it was official. Carl Polad and his championship team could finally savor the moment. A time to treasure for the rest of their lives. Now I had the time of my life. No, I never felt like this before. Yes, I swear it's a truth. And I owe it all to you. Twins, wrap 
wrap it up here at Arlington Stadium as they win their first championship since 1970. Drive, base hit, left field, one run is in. Here comes Bernanski. He's going to score the Clint's lead, five to two. The basketball swung a long drive. Center field, way back, way back. It is a grand move. Burbank, a grand slam over over the center field fence. At the time of my life No, I never felt this way before Never felt Yes, this I way. swear It's the truth And I hope With the realization of their monumental accomplishments finally setting in, Minnesota regaled their twins with a parade. The world champions were the toast of the Twin Cities, and the fans hailed their conquering heroes. The steps of the St. Paul Capitol Building served as a platform for Kirby and the rest of the twins to salute their sea of adoring fans. But there was still one more trip to be made. Oh, it doesn't look like he's having too much fun, though, does he? A visit to the White House and a congratulatory salute from the president. You know, right up there until the end, there were a few skeptics saying the twins didn't stand a chance. But with Frank's pitching, and Gary's fielding, and the hitting of Kirby Puckett and Dan Gladden, and Tom Brunanski and Kent Herbeck, your team was a shoe in. As Kirby said after the final victory, you're number one in the whole world. The final note in a magical storybook season. But perhaps the biggest source of twins' magic came from the fans themselves, the devoted followers who helped the players rise to the occasion. And the players themselves acknowledged the support of their fans, thankful for their unwavering support. Uh, everyone had thanked me for the year that we had, but at this particular time, I would like to thank all of you for what you've done for us. Again, I want to thank the people of Minnesota for uh, making this a fun year, and let's do it again next year. We did it. We all did it. We, we, rode, we rode in the boat together, and we stuck together as a team, and uh, we, won, we won it all. So, I mean, there's nothing else for me to say except uh, I'll never forget it. Thanks for the memories, guys. We're no longer the Twinkies. We're the world champion Minnesota Twins.